Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Two Kidney Bryant, and there's Jerry over there, and this is Stuff You Should Know. The uh, kid, kidney donation edition. Yeah, we did one on organ donation, right? Yeah, and we did one and on kidney stones. And kidney stones. So you put them together, you get this episode. That's right. And this is from uh, Dave Roos, our pal. And uh, this is good. Should we – Should we? this is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's that kind of day. How it's going. Yeah. We're, uh, we're in person again, by the way. Yeah. We should just tell everyone that I'm making a fool of myself right in front of you for a change. It's nice to see yeah. in person. <laughs> um, and I should also point out they, um, that this is a double Dave day. Because mm. he did the last one, too. That's right. Our uh, inflation. Uh, right. Interest rates. Yeah. I forgot what we talked about. <laughs> I've already forgotten all of it. So Dave did some digging for us um, and came up with some pretty surprising stats that I certainly had no idea about with kidney disease in particular. Mm-hmm. But something like 15% of all um, um, American adults have some form of chronic kidney disease. 37 million people right now. 37 million and 90,000 Americans are uh, on the list waiting for a kidney transplant. And each year, this is very sad, uh, about 5,000 Americans die while waiting and another 3,000 more become uh, too sick to get that transplant. So basically 8,000-ish people are either dying or on their way to dying because they don't have a kidney that they can get. Right. And then with, you know, 37 million adults, just the adults alone with some form of chronic kidney disease, as their disease progresses, uh, they end up on the list, mm-hmm. uh, the transplant list. So, um, Which we'll I, talk about in a sec. What's, what's really interesting about kidneys and in particular kidney donations is it's one of a very select few organs mm-hmm. that you can donate while you're alive. That's right. <laughs> and then whistle off back to your normal life down one kidney. Yeah, you can't donate your heart to somebody. No. It's a very sweet gesture. Sure. But uh, you got two kidneys. You only need one. Uh, I think the number, the percentage is if you donate a kidney, which is interesting because this the one kidney you have must ramp up production because your kidney oh, yeah. function only goes down – what was it, 15 to 20 percent or something like that? Yeah, something, nothing, 25 it, it's to not, 35 maybe? Yeah, it's not 50 percent. Right, and that's definitely doable. Like you can go through life with yeah. one kidney performing 65 percent of your previous function. That's right. That's not bad. And we should probably just kind of point out some of the amazing things the kidneys do. There are these two fist-sized organs, or one. Yeah. Um, depending on whether you've donated or not. That's right. Or three, uh, which will get sure, you yeah. back to the show. Just uh, just under your rib cage on either side of your spine. So have your loved one make a fist with each hand, come up behind you, put their fist under your rib cage. Gently. Yeah. Just on either side of your spine. Mm-hmm. And there's your kidneys. Right. Uh, and kidneys do a lot of things. Uh, the main, you know, like sort of the money job that the kidneys do is they act as the filter system for your for your blood. Yeah. And that's the big thing. They filter about 200 quarts of fluids every day. That's, uh, and that's not just blood. That's blood and waste fluid. That's so much. That's a lot. 200 quarts is a lot. And yeah. kidneys are always working. Yeah. Uh, and within the kidneys, there are uh, about one to one and a half million tiny little filters inside the kidney called nephrons. Mm-hmm. If you just think Nora Ephron. Or Nefertiti. Or Nefertiti. Uh, and those nephrons are what's doing the actual filtering. They're just tiny little filters. Uh, they also, what else do they do? They also release a hormone called uh, erythropoietin, uh, EPO. It regulates production of red blood cells in mm-hmm. bone marrow. Very mm-hmm. big deal. Yeah. Um, they also convert vitamin D from a non-usable form from like the sun mm-hmm. into a usable form, which is pretty important because vitamin D helps you retain and absorb calcium and phosphorus for building bones, reduces inflammation, right. possibly combats tumor growth. Mm-hmm. Um, and all this is coming from your kidneys doing its thing. And then one other thing we kind of skipped over a little bit that I think is worth pointing out. Of those 200 quarts of fluid every day, two quarts of it, I think you said, is waste. Yeah. 
you pee it out. It gets converted into urine, sent to the bladder, and you pee it out. Yeah. And finally, Chuck, finally, the eight eight ounce glasses of water a day makes sense. It's not arbitrary anymore. <laughs> you never realized that that no. <laughs> I never understood. I thought it was actually made up, an arbitrary number, yeah. that 64 ounces, because that's how much you pee out on a normal day because that's how much your kidneys filter out as waste. So you got to replenish it. Yeah. This is funny. That, you know, well, I'm this days old <laughs> when I finally realized right, this that. This many days old. Yeah. Uh, what else? They also release a hormone called renin. Uh, it regulates your blood pressure, and we'll see blood pressure – and kidneys have a, a lot to do with one another. Yep. And what else? Anything? You know what? I bet you there's other things a kidney does that it just doesn't like to take credit for. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the problems uh, with your kidneys is that they can break down. They're susceptible to all sorts of other stuff going on in your body. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big things that puts stress on your kidneys, well, two of the big things that put stress on your kidneys is such, Chuck, colon. Colon. You've got blood pressure, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. which exerts pressure on the walls of your blood vessels, which in turn exerts pressure on your kidneys, yeah. damaging their function. And the big one, the, the, the big daddy of what causes kidney, chronic kidney disease is diabetes. That's right. That's the number one. High blood pressure is number two. And, uh, you know, basically high blood sugar is going to damage the blood vessels in the kidney. It's going to kill those nephrons mm -hmm. that we were talking about. Those are the filters that actually do the filtering. And uh, chronic CDK, chronic kidney, sorry, CKD, chronic <laughs> kidney disease, uh, they, they call it the silent disease because you can be in, you can be through the first few stages of chronic kidney disease and not feel any symptoms at all. Right. And not know what's going on. So it's very dangerous. Uh, there are five total. And stages one through four, your kidneys are still doing their thing. They're struggling. But stage five is when you're in end-stage uh, renal disease or renal failure. And that's when you your kidneys maybe aren't working at all and you're going to dialysis every day. Yeah. And you need a new kidney. Yes. Um, and we'll talk a little more about dialysis. But, yes, once you hit stage five, you're – like, you, your kidneys just aren't doing the work anymore. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's not like they just stop functioning little by little. Mm -hmm. They're unable to filter out waste. So the waste starts to accumulate and build up, and you have all sorts of terrible symptoms like nausea, um, fatigue, vomiting. I think you feel poisoned is what I've heard. Yeah, I think that's basically what's going on. Yeah. Is your body is being poisoned because it's no longer able to filter it out. So um, there's a lot of racial disparities, too, as far as kidney diseases go. And apparently it tracks very closely to um, uh, diabetes. Yeah. Um, apparently, if you're a black American, you are four times more likely to have kidney failure um, than a white American. Hispanic Americans, 1.3 times. And Native Americans, 1.2 times. And again, like that's the, those same rates are pretty close to the dis disparity in diabetes, mm -hmm. but also it has to do with things like access to health care, right. access to certain kinds of food that may not lead to diabetes or mm -hmm. will lead to diabetes. Um, there's a lot of stuff kind of caught up into it that um, it's not entirely straightforward that everybody has an equal opportunity to develop kidney disease. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's really sad that it, it, it you know, it seems like everything comes down to money and access to money. And if you live in the United States and you are uh, somewhere on the poverty spectrum, mm -hmm. then you're more likely to not have health care, not go to the doctor, eat worse food, get diabetes, yeah. have kidneys fail. Right. It's all sort of in lockstep with one another. And then it gets even more insidious than that because once you get to stage five, you might not have reliable transportation to go right. do dialysis. And dialysis is extremely time-consuming. It is. So it's going to be hard for you to keep down a job. Yeah, my neighbor, uh, before they moved, and sadly he passed away, Miss Jesse and Mr. Otis, he <laughs> had his uh, – he had the ambulance come. or you know, It, it looks like an ambulance, but it's not a, an emergency one. Mm -hmm. It's just the transpo. They picked him up every day, took him to dialysis. Wow. Brought him home, and this was for the last couple of years of his life, you know, going every wow. single day. And Jeez. It's a good dude. I wish I would have uh, gotten to know him a little bit better before he passed. But yeah. um, So dialysis is short for hemodialysis, and 
it is literally just a, a machine that does the filtering that your kidneys do. So mm-hmm. you sit there for, uh, what is it, like four hours? Yep, usually about three times a week. Yeah, three times a week, four-hour sessions, and y- they just clean your blood in full with yeah. each session. Yeah, there's like a little membrane that um, doesn't let the important stuff like red blood cells get through. Right. But it does let those waste products get through and they just get sloshed out, whereas the blood that doesn't go through the membrane gets put back into your body. Yeah, and you're on dialysis for life Yeah. Uh, until unless you can get a new kidney. Mm-hmm. And then even if you do get a new kidney, you might be on dialysis for a little while, as we'll see. Yeah. So, Chuck, I feel like this is a good time to take a break, just off the top of my head. Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back, everybody. Okay, so it's not fun to have kidney failure, especially stage five kidney failure. Yeah. Because you're going to dialysis a lot, um, and there's a lot of terrible symptoms involved in it. Um, If you are uh, at that point, you're going to be put on um, an organ donation list. You're going to become a, um, a recipient or potential recipient of a donated kidney. That's right. And that means you have signed up with uh, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, which is managed by a nonprofit called the United Network for Organ Sharing. Mm -hmm. A lot worse places you can donate your money to, by the way. And it's, uh, you know, Dave points out very astutely that it's not like a waiting list as in, you know, there's 90,000 people or more waiting for a kidney. So if you sign up for one, then you have 89,999 people in front of you. <laughs> right. And it just very slowly, you know, that time ticks away. Yeah. Uh, it's a network. It is uh, – it's a pool of candidates and because you have to get matched with a kidney. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are all these criteria, uh, one of which is blood type. Um, don't have to have necessarily the exact blood type. I think if you have like A, you can get AB. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a little bit of crossover there. And O is universal, right? Oh, is it O negative? I think Or just so. O? O we did a thing on blood. It was it was a good one. We did a live one. That's right. Remember my father-in-law spoke up when I did a blood <laughs> test. He said, Josh is pregnant. <laughs> That's right. He got more laughs than all of mine combined that night. I remember that. That was a very, like, one of the only funny audience jokes that we've ever had. It really was. That was yelled out. It's high-quality heckling. <laughs> that was really good. I forgot about <laughs> that. That was for the Atlanta Science Festival. That yeah, was fun. Yeah. Um, but where was I? That just totally threw me that I'm trying to picture you pregnant now. Well, get a load of me, buddy. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, blood type is one. Uh, The size of the organ, it's got to be a good fit. So, like, a little kid can't get a big adult kidney. You wouldn't think about that, but it is true. And, I mean, it's not just true with kidneys. With any organ, like, I saw it put, like, a basketball player's lung won't fit in a child. Right. (laughs) It's like, sure. Yeah. Those are wise words. Good point. Uh, And then geography is one because, uh, as you'll see, if you get a kidney donated from someone that you don't know, uh, it's not like a family member, mm-hmm. then that kidney is going to be on ice basically uh, for a little while. Uh, it's going to be transported maybe or maybe you're transported, but there's going to be a little bit of time. Uh, they don't just like you know put you on the table like in the movies. They'd put you on the table next to your brother. <laughs> and they would just like slide one kidney right in, you know, just across the room right. to, the, to the other. Make the pew right. sound. <laughs> Uh, so geography is a consideration. So within this network, you know, there's a big algorithm that's going to match blood types and all these things. And like, hey, you live in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. We got a kidney in Tuscaloosa. Mm-hmm. So you guys are a pretty good match. Yeah. And so uh, with each new organ that comes up for um, donation, mm-hmm. uh, you get a new a new score calculated by yeah. the computer. Like, it's not like you get your score assigned. It's all contextual based on your relation to that organ that's that's being considered, that's being donated. Yeah, and also we should point out that it, it's also based on your need, mm-hmm. like if you're, you know, how urgent it is in, in a lot of cases. Yeah, it's also based, though, on, on some other stuff, too, which is, you know, kind of calculating, but it makes sense. Um, your age, 
Yeah. The younger you are, the higher your score, which yeah. makes it likelier for you to get that. Um, the likelihood that you will survive the, yeah. the procedure, the likelihood that you will um, reject the organ or not, sensitization, I think is what they call it. There's a bunch of different factors. And this is fairly recent, this pool um, um, method. Uh, and I, I, it's kind of revolutionized things and apparently made it a lot better, a lot um, – it's uh, from what I understand, it's a lot more sensible and fair. Yeah, and it also makes sense. Like once you see the numbers, like every kidney is super important. Sure. And so they want to give them to people where you have the best chance for that kidney to work over, you know, for ten to fifteen, twenty years. Right. Yeah. Can't waste no kidney left behind. No. Oh man, can you imagine if they were just like, oh, we left it on the plane. <laughs> just forget about it. You're like, I just. Donated that kidney for nothing. Right. It's in the trash now. Right. There's a story out there, and I kind of want to hear it. See, I, I pictured more like Cheech and Chong were piloting the plane, and they're like, what's in the cooler, man? <laughs> <laughs> right. And all of a sudden, it's a movie. They're looking for like some some good, uh, That's pretty good. good marijuana. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, Snoop Dogg as the pilot in Soul Plane. I never saw that. Was that good? You, no, it wasn't at all. <laughs> At all. Yeah. It looked like a sort of a homage to the That's sort of so bad, bad 70s uh, comedies, you know. Mm -hmm. It was. It there, just, there, where there was no – it was like, hey, here's an idea. Let's get a bunch of like funny people and get them really high or drunk mm -hmm. and there, there's your movie. Mm -hmm. That's, that was exactly what they but tried to do. But this is an airport. This. Right. That's the, that's the twist. Yeah. All right. It's I'm not going to see it then. The twist. Yeah, no, there's no reason to. I I, I demand that you not see it, actually. <laughs> Don't waste uh, your time. How are you going to sign up to be an organ donor? What are the couple of good ways you can do that? Well, one way is whenever you go get your license renewed at the old DMV in the yeah. United States uh, or the DMV in France, <laughs> um, they're going to ask you if you want to be an organ donor. And, and you can say yes, and they will put it on your license. Yes, organ donor. So that if you, you know, buy the farm out and about and mm -hmm. you've got your driver's license on you, the doctors and the people at the hospital are going to look at your ID. And if they see yes, they're going to go to your family and say, your, your loved one here um, who's now regretfully deceased – said that they want to donate their organs. Or will you sign off on this? It seems yeah. to have been their wishes. And you can still say no if you're a family member, but um, probably you're going to say yes, especially if your deceased loved one said, hey, I marked yes right. on my, uh, that I want to donate organs on my driver's license. If I die, make sure my organs get donated. They're probably going to go along with it. Yeah, I think it's kind of funny that – I wonder what percentage of people that sign up at the DMV for organ donation and the kidneys that actually go to other people and organs that successfully save lives, mm -hmm. how many of those start with the two words, why not? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't need them. You're at the DMV. You're bored out of your mind. You've been there for right. far too long. <laughs> yeah. And they ask you this question. You go, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. That is the most interesting <laughs> question you've been asked in that whole experience. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe the biggest question you can answer in your life yeah. is whether or not you will donate your kidneys mm -hmm. and your organs to save a human life. Yeah. And people probably just so go. the DMV. Yeah. Why not? So if you've been to the DMV and you said no and you or regretted it. Oh, okay. But if you said no yeah, and yeah, you yeah. wanted to, you you can still go and uh, register, right? Yeah, you got to register me, M -E dot org, and you can register there. Uh, and here's the deal. In 2021, here's some more stats for you. Okay. There were 40,000 total organ transplants. Uh, I think most of those are, I think, was it like 85% are kidney transplants? Like yes. Like far and away the most are kidney transplants. Mm -hmm. And only 6,500 of those 45 uh, came from living donors, which was I have a relative or I'm just a benevolent human who wants to give a kidney to anonymously to somebody. I know, man. I mean, yeah, talk about sainthood. Yeah. Uh, so two-thirds of all kidney transplants are from deceased donors. So like you said, it's a lot of times it's accidents, car and motorcycle accidents where there's like traumatic head injury. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the but the organs are still in pretty good shape. Yeah, you're young. You're in good shape, and so uh, you know you may be brain dead, and they can 
the word harvest always sounds so cruel, but they can they can harvest borrow your organs. No, it's permanently. harvest. It's definitely harvest. Remember in our um, our uh, book uh, that chapter on Jack Kevorkian, mm-hmm. he had that that idea in the I think sixties or seventies where he was like, well, if we're going to execute people, let's just execute them through organ harvesting. You know, we right. start to perform surgery on them, and we harvest their organs, and then once we're done, they're just they're dead. Right, but and we've got their like, organs. Yeah, then we're we're donating their organs, and everybody's like, it's a really great idea, but you're a creepy dude, right. and I think you're the last person <laughs> who should be espousing this kind of stuff. Well, maybe he shouldn't have uh, expressed this idea while imitating Werner Herzog. <laughs> <laughs> right. And where are your pants? That's right. Uh, so that means at the end of the day, one b- human body— <laughs> Werner can Herzog. save uh, up to eight. Noel does a pretty good Werner Herzog. He's oh, doing yeah? a movie crush, yeah. But the best out. ever is Paula Tompkins. His Werner Herzog is fantastic. I haven't heard his. Uh, just look it up on the internet. It's, okay, it's right. great. Uh, one single human body, an organ donor, can save up to eight lives, uh, and that is just with the organs. And then you've got tissue donation. You've got eyes that can bring uh, sight to someone. We should totally do one on eye the transplants. Yeah, might also show you the killer of the person whose eyes you got, <laughs> in which case you're morally responsible for chasing that killer uh-huh. down and turning them in. And bringing them to justice or exacting revenge if it's a really good movie. Sure. A Bridge of Fond type movie? Was that the, the actual plot of one or was was that just a yeah. typical movie plot? I don't remember who was in it though. Was it Jennifer Eight? I don't know. No, Jennifer Eight was um, a, a blind woman, a sightless woman, uh, who was going to be the eighth victim of a serial killer uh, who was targeting blind women. Okay. And I, I could spoil it for everybody. <laughs> I'm not going to. It's actually worth seeing. It's a good 90s really? movie with Andy Garcia. And yeah. I don't remember who Thurman, else. Wasn't it? Was, was it? Was it her? Yeah, it's a good, good movie. I think it's out there still. Or I'm thinking of the movie— uh, where the guy got the hand transplant. And Encino Man. The hand was from a serial killer, and so he got a bad hand that wanted to do bad things. Jeff Fahey, I think. The Who's lawnmower Jeff man. But Fahey, no. Jeff Fahey was the lawnmower man. Okay, I never saw that one. Uh, I mean, it might have been called something as basic as, like, bad hand or something. Was it called idle hands? <laughs> no, that was different. And that was not good. I'll look it up, and we'll, we'll – how about this? So, folks, stick around for listener mail. We'll look it up in the interim. Oh, okay. We'll announce it at the beginning of listener Finally, mail. Finally, year 14, we got a new <laughs> hook for the show. Or maybe I can just make up an email that fake Jeff Fahey sent in. Okay. <laughs> Remember me? We need That's a, how it starts. We need a fake Jeff Fahey sound effect, right? like our colon <laughs> sound effect. Uh, all right. So, living donation is something we should talk about. This is, like you said at the beginning, one of the only organs you can donate. I mean, is it the only one? No, the, you can also donate a portion of your uterus okay. and a portion of your liver. Okay, portions. Yes, but other than that, that's it. Right. So uh, I got a little bit of history here. Um, if you're talking kidney transplants, you got to go back to 1902 was when they did a dog kidney transplant uh, in Austria. Mm-hmm. The dog did not make it, of course, but the uh, it did produce urine for a couple of days, the kidney. Man. Not bad. I know. And that really just kind of takes you back to some 1902. really unsettling oh, yeah. black and white yeah. m- <laughs> view of like some terrible experiment. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see. In 1909, apparently there were efforts to transplant kidneys from humans, dead humans, to monkeys. Mm-hmm, as you do. 39, the first deceased human donor, I think, was performed in Russia. But the organ, never, it didn't take. Organ never worked. But they tried it in 39. They tried their best. From human to human. Uh, 53, you finally had your first successful temporary human kidney transplant in Paris. It was twins, right? A uh, 16-year-old boy received one from his mother. Oh, okay. Uh, as a living donor. And then 54, I think, was the twins. It was the first long-term successful kidney transplant by Joseph Murray, who won a, a Nobel Prize for that. Sure. And then 62 is the first non-related, no genetics involved whatsoever. So it, well, it's only been since the 1950s, 1960s that we've been able to yeah. successfully transplant kidneys. But once we got it, we got it 
pretty good. Yeah. We like, have it down pat. Let's do this a lot, guys. This is fun. So um, if you are a living donor and you do donate your kidney, I think that makes out up about a quarter of kidney donations today, right? Yeah. Is a living donor. Somebody saying, take my kidney, put it in somebody else. More often than not, it's put it in my brother, put it in my spouse. Yeah, three quarters of the time, it's you're related. Right. Um, but there's that still means that 25% of 25% of all kidney donations. So that means however many thousand kidney donations are are – Donated by people who are just saying, like, here, take my kidney and give it to whoever needs it. That's right. And sometimes that is anonymously. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a spouse. Sometimes you hear about someone in your community. But, yeah, sometimes it's you don't even know anybody, and you're just like, you know what? I'm going to save a life. Yeah. I'm at the DMV. <laughs> Right, And I want to save a life. Yeah, I'm going to do it. So if you do do that, you're a living donor. Um, and... There's a lot of advantages to a living donation compared to a dead, deceased donate donation. A, a you know donor. an organ taken from somebody who's died, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, so if you donate your kidney, um, there's like the chances of the kidney being rejected are lower mm -hmm. compared to a deceased donor. Um, the the kidney will probably start functioning independently, like on its own. Um, much more quickly than a deceased donor one because the deceased donor one is going to be um, basically put on ice if, if for a little while mm -hmm. while it's transported. By Cheech and Chong. Kept, you know, kind of, yeah. you know. Yes, exactly. Um, there's also um, a difference in the amount of time that the average kidney lasts between a, de a deceased donor and a living donor, right? Yeah, well, you tend to live longer and your kidney lasts between 15 and 20 years on average from a living donor. Uh, it's only about a decade from a deceased donor. Mm -hmm. And you also have a better chance if you are genetically related of avoiding rejection. Right. So, so um, living, genetically related living donor is like the creme de la creme of getting a kidney. Right, exactly. Um, there's also more convenient too. Um, if you are a living donor, you can say, let's do this like, a week from Tuesday. Right. That works best for me, not this guy just died. We need, we need to get this into a recipient like as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, let's find somebody kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so that that's, uh, that's another big advantage too. So I think we've established here living kidney donations – are the way to go if you can do it. Yeah, from a relative, ideally. So let's take a break because um, there's actually ways to maximize how kidneys get donated, Chuck. And we're going to tell everybody about it after this. Let's do it. So on the kidney exchange, it's pretty cool how they've worked this out over the years. Uh, there is something called paired exchanges, and it goes a little something like this. You want to donate a kidney to your relative, to your, to your niece. Okay. Uh, but you don't have the right blood type. You can get paired up with someone who does have the right blood type who needs your kidney. Uh -huh. They'll be like, wait a minute. My niece needs a kidney. Right. You've got their, her blood type, and I've got your niece's blood type. Mm -hmm. So let's just get together and make this all work out. Crisscross, yeah, as Alfred Hitchcock it, put it. It's a paired exchange, but then that is multiplied exponentially by the donor chain, right? Yes. So, like, if if you have a good computer handy mm -hmm. to run an algorithm for you, because apparently it's very difficult to do— um, you can take a bunch of these mismatched pairs rather than four people. Mm -hmm. You can take, I think, up to 70 people. Yeah. And one good Samaritan donor who says, take my kidney, I don't care who gets it, can set off a chain yeah. of paired matching that can satisfy up to 70, 70 recipients. Yeah, so cool. 
through the through a combination of one person donating it without any you know just saying take my kidney put it in somebody and then a bunch of paired paired matches all all like 70 people so it makes it really difficult to say like i don't really want to donate my kidney when not only are you saving one person's life you're setting off a chain reaction yeah that allows for 70 different people to get their kidney because you donated yours without without directing it toward anybody in particular. Yeah. And if that's not the first thing you say on every first date you go to for the rest <laughs> of your life, <laughs> right. then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Uh, we should mention that the uh, there was a Nobel Prize winning economist yeah. named Alvin Roth who, who came up with this donor chain idea. And I don't think we said you, um, you have to be 18 to donate a kidney. Mm-hmm. You have to be in good health and you have like – Rocking kidneys, basically, and also in good health otherwise. Yeah. Like a a 16-year-old can't donate a kidney. That's the other reason why uh, a living donor is advantageous because of that luxury of time because you can run a battery of tests. Yes. You have time to run tons of tests to make sure they're a perfect match for this other person. That's right. So when you do say, okay, I'm going to do it. And by the way, uh, Dave said from researching this, he was inspired to do it. I think he may have put himself on a list or was going to, although it may have worn off by now. <laughs> Who knows? We'll have to ask him. Right. But if you do this, um, you are going to undergo surgery. Um, it's just as simple as that. And it's a serious surgery. Like, they're sure. removing your kidney. Like I said, we've got it down pat since we've been doing it since the 50s or 60s, and now they can usually do it laparoscopically. Yeah, how does that work? I think they just squeeze it real tight into this really <laughs> long pencil-like. Really? F- no. I, I mean, how I do they get know. the kidney out? Though? I don't know. I have no idea. That's the one thing that flummoxed me, and I almost like Google to see if I could find you know a surgery I could watch mm-hmm, mm-hmm. laparoscopic kidney removal. Because laparoscopic means it's like a very small incision. Yeah, You're using very very thin like cameras and very thin tools, but then. How do you get the kidney out? If it's fist size, I don't know. I mean, this is larger than a laparoscopic, um, sure. you know, uh, in- incision. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a widow maker right here. Uh, and here to me is the fact of the show. Uh, I never knew this. They don't take out your bad kidney. <laughs> yeah. Did not know that. They just leave it in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess they did the research and found out that they didn't need to. Yeah. And that doesn't do any harm and maybe be more dangerous to take it out. I can see that. Than to leave it in. But you end up, if you have a kidney, with three kidneys. Yeah. So I I don't, I mean, surely they detach those kidneys. Well, yeah, because you got to attach the other, right? Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) So that's what they do. The surgery is to, they take it out of you. And at that point, you're like, okay, I'm done. It's all recovery for me. But they have to put it in the other person. And like you said, they leave the other kidneys. They attach the one to the blood vessels so that it's, you know, getting the blood supply Mm -hmm. to filter. And then also they attach it to your ureter um, so that it can transport waste to your bladder. And uh, supposedly it's actually a pretty effective surgery and with minimal um, uh, negative outcomes. Yeah, recovery time for the donors, a couple of days in the hospital, mm-hmm. one to two weeks at home, six to eight weeks total, and then you got to come in at 6, 12, and 24 months for checkups. Um, like uh, we said, you lose 25 to 35% of your kidney function, but that's not 50, so your one kidney must, like, ramp it up. Um, and then you said pretty good outcomes. There, are, uh, I think this is between 2006 and 2008. Mm-hmm. Of the 17,000 – oh, there's your number right there. If the numbers hold, that would be uh, 17,000 over three years. So about five 5,000 and, and change, change a year. At least back then. Yeah. Unless there's been a rush. Yeah. Um, only 12 donor deaths out of the 17,402. And only one of those was from the surgery, from like hemorrhaging – hemorrhaging – hemorrhaging? <laughs> it's close. Hem. Hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging. God, that sounds weird. Hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging. Yeah. Okay. It was purposefully weird. <laughs> During surgery. Yeah. Bleeding too much. <laughs> Don't forget to complete the sentence. <laughs> that was very porky pig of me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a pretty good track record. 12 deaths out of 
17,402 yeah. transplants. Um, they also studied people uh, for long-term effects and found that somebody who had donated a kidney had about the same um, chance of suffering end-stage renal failure mm-hmm. as the general population. So yeah. it didn't increase their chances one bit. And I was like, okay, all right, Internet, let me go a few more pages deep. Like, where's where's the where's the, the real talk yeah. about the long-term consequences of donating a kidney? And from what I can see, study after study, it shows, like, there's really not any long-term effects um, that – uh, after about six or eight weeks of recovery, you can go back to a normal life. Mm-hmm. During that time, you're going to feel very fatigued. Yeah. Your function is going to be decreased. But if you say, I'm donating my kidney, I'm just going to take two months off, basically, right. um, of life, you know, like stressful life, um, that's really not too bad. No. Considering that you basically go back to normal life after two months and your kidney the one kidney you have is still doing 65% of the original function. Yeah, like if you work from home, you have no excuse. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Uh, Dave did put in here, and I looked into this a little more, that a drawback might be um, it might affect your life insurance or disqualify you or increase your rates. Yeah. So I poked around that because that sounded like a horrible thing, uh, and it wouldn't have surprised me. But it looks like there are a lot of protections in place from the Affordable Care Act for stuff like this, Mm -hmm. thankfully. And if you have never had insurance, you have your kidney removed and you go to get life insurance for the first time, then you may not be able to get it as easily, but you're not booted from your life insurance policy because you donated a kidney Mm. or your rates aren't going to skyrocket because you donated a kidney. Gotcha. It's against the law. It should be. Yeah. So, um, there's a risk of rejection. Like, that's something you have to go into it knowing. Like, you might donate your kidney, and it just might not work. Yeah. Despite, despite all the tests, despite all of the um, the care given into matching you and your kidney with a, a, a recipient, it still might get rejected. But they have developed um, a lot of different drugs to cut down on the chance of rejection, right? Yeah. They're called anti-rejection drugs or immunosuppressants, and there are a couple— kinds. Uh, there's one that they that are super powerful that they give you at the time of the transplant called induction agents. And then you've got maintenance agents. Uh, and there were basically four different kinds of maintenance agents. And the way this one website I saw put it, I think it was at, at kidney.org or whatever. <laughs> that sounds made up. <laughs> uh, was that uh, they said, look at it as like a mortgage your down payment is the induction agent, mm-hmm. like the heavy-duty drugs they give you when they do the transplant, and the maintenance agents are like your monthly payment. Mm-hmm. And the bigger the down payment, the lower the monthly. So if you, if the induction agents are really, really work well, mm-hmm. then you're not going to be on as many long-term medications for maintenance. And wh- I, I didn't really recognize any of the drugs except for prednisone, the steroid. Yeah, I didn't either. I saw the most common combination of drugs is – Three things. One called uh, ch- tacrolimus, uh, which is a uh, calcine- <laughs> calcinevrin inhibitor. Mm-hmm. Uh, one called mycophenolate mofetil, <laughs> which is an anti-proliferate, uh, and then prednisone. Okay. And I saw that you're generally on these for life, but they can, you know, scale down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're ever off of them completely, but. Um, Yeah, I think 30% of kidney recipients experience some sort of rejection. So those. But it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean that, like, that's it, it didn't work. I don't think so. Back to square one necessarily. Yeah, I think, like, in a lot of those cases, you can keep that kidney if the drugs are working. Right. So, um, the the entire thing, this entire thing, whether it's a dead donor, a deceased donor, I'm sorry, I keep calling it dead donor. I know it's not quite right. Yeah. Even though it's accurate. Um, or living donors of kidneys, all of this is based on altruism. Yeah. The entire organ procurement, organ donation system everywhere in the world, save for one country, is based on the kindness of, of and generosity of donors who do it for n- no money whatsoever, just out of the goodness of their heart. Yes. And that's the way that a lot of people think it should be. That's the way that it, it's... Um, it's enshrined in law that that's the way that it has to be in the United States. 
There's a uh, uh, law called the National Organ Transplant Act of 1984 um, that says you cannot gain financially. Yeah. Um, or uh, I, I can't remember exactly how they put it, but you can't make any kind of like gain from from donating your organ. And I was like, wh- where did that law come from? What prompted that? Well, probably the black market for organs, huh? It turned out there was there was a guy, so that was the act of 1984. In 1982, there was a doctor in Virginia named H. Barry Jacobs uh-huh. who announced that he was setting up a market for organs. He was going to create a brokerage for organs. He's like, there's no federal law against it. That's exactly right. (laughs) And so they went and made a federal law against it because they're like, that is objectively unethical and immoral. And that's kind of the basis for organ donation in this country. And again, every country in the world except for Iran, that it's unethical to make money selling organs or to pay someone for their organs because they're worried that it sets off a whole cascade of problems. Yeah, I think they try and make it cost neutral for the donor, which means your expenses are covered. Like you're not going to be paying, like the recipient's insurance is going to be paying for all the operations and surgeries and all that stuff. Yeah. And then there are, uh, you know, private nonprofits that can also help cover like travel Mm -hmm. and if you're a low-income donor, help pay for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you're still not getting like paid to do it. Uh, And the idea there is ethically is that – you know, the the dystopian science fiction plot, which is there's a class of wealthy people who harvest the poor mm-hmm. on organ farms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like something out of a movie, but it's also something that could very well happen right. if you let that kind of thing, you know, take place. Uh, you know, black market and human trafficking again, like you mentioned. And then uh, another one which I didn't think of is that um, the motivation for someone doing it if you're getting paid, like you may not, you may fudge a little bit on your questionnaires yeah. and uh, like fake something to make money to get an organ taken out of your body. Yeah, it's almost like they've identified it as such an a valuable thing yeah. that you can't you can't assign any kind of monetary value to it. You you can't allow that to happen, or else nothing but bad things are going to happen. And there's actually polls that support this, although some people say that's stupid. We should we no matter how how many um, generous people are donating organs, it, the demand is still not there. I mean, you said it yourself, like mm-hmm. 5,000 people die on organ transplant waiting lists every year in the United States alone. That's just in the U.S. alone. Yeah. You know, people die all over the world on organ transplant lists every year. And so people say, that's stupid. If people are willing to sell, like, their kidney in particular um, – let them do it. It's a free world. It's a free country, at least. So what's the problem? Yeah. I mean, I think the idea, I'm not lobbying for this, but they have floated things like a like a $50,000 tax rebate that mm-hmm. you can uh, absorb over like a decade. Right. Or wipe out your student loans or something like that. Like they're not literally just cutting you a check. Things like that are interesting because – um, donating a kidney saves taxpayers close to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in medical costs uh, paid out by Medicare right. for dialysis and things like that. And uh, there was another analysis that found that paying donors forty five thousand dollars for a kidney would result in a net gain of forty six billion dollars mm-hmm. in lowered medical costs and better health uh, overall health and in- outcomes. Mm-hmm. So, like something like that is interesting, not just like harvesting organs for cash. But if people want to take a big fat tax rebate over a decade, mm-hmm. it leads to less taxpayer payouts for Medicaid and uh, or for Medicare. Better health outcomes? I don't know. Something we're thinking about. Yeah. Th- and other people would say this that's already going on. There's a very healthy black market for organs all around the world. Right. I saw an estimate on some human trafficking website that was something like 10,000 kidneys a year are um, procured and transplanted on the black market. Wow. But then, Chuck, ultimately you have – there is one country, Iran, that allows payment for organs. I think it's like 4,500 bucks. Something like that. And then also like your – Not thousand. Right. Yeah. It's a pretty insubstantial amount if you're selling a kidney compared to, say, like the 45 grand the U.S. is considering. Right. Or I shouldn't say the U.S. is considering. Americans have come up with in a study. Right. But – 
The, there is the one stat that stood out to me that I think kind of suggests, you know, not applying money to organ procurement is that 85% of a uh, 2001 study of 300 Iranian paid organ donors, 85% said that if they could go back, they would not have sold their kidney. No, there you have it. There you have it, pretty much. Got anything else about kidney transplants and donations and all that? No. Well, again, if you want to uh, donate your organs uh, and you aren't going to the DMV anytime soon, go to registerme.org. Uh, and since I said registerme.org, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this DB Cooper follow up. Did you oh, see this? wow. No. Pretty interesting. And this is from uh, Holly. Uh, hey guys, Holly from Texas here. Been listening about six months and I'm obsessed. Uh, I turned to the Facebook groups to suggest some fan favorite episodes and D.B. Cooper, the live episode, was mentioned a lot. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of a story you might enjoy. Uh, several years ago, I was at a small family gathering at my grandparents and we were sitting around chatting about different topics and memories. And my grandma casually says, oh, that's just like the time when the FBI tapped our phones because they thought grandpa was D.B. Cooper. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, I, of course, did a dramatic double take, slammed both of my hands on the table and exclaimed, what? I mean, I was floored. At the time, I was in my late 30s. I'd never heard this story in my whole life. That's the thing with grandparents. You hear this stuff <laughs> and you're like, how did I not know this? I know. Um, I, of course, had to dramatically turn to my grandpa with narrowed eyes and say, who are you? <laughs> my grandma was very nonchalant about the whole thing. And I was like, wait, 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 explain, please. She didn't have much more info, but I guess my grandpa was cleared, obviously. Uh, and it's still a mystery why they suspected my grandpa, uh, mainly considering the fact that they lived in New Mexico at the time. We sadly lost my grandma in July 2021, mm. uh, but I'm happy to report that my grandpa is still doing well, even though I could never picture my cowboy boot-loving, heavily starched Wrangler jean-wearing grandpa in a skinny tie from JCPenney, although he does enjoy his daily bourbon. Oh, uh, and there's that, a clue. <laughs> maybe that was it. Yeah. Uh, so that's from Holly, and that's a great email, Holly. That is one of the all-time greats, Holly. I love that. She's like, also, my grandpa pays for everything from a bag of money that he keeps in the <laughs> shed out back. Yeah. We, uh, we always got unmarked $100 bills for birthdays. Right. Uh, if you want to be like Holly and tell us one of the great family stories that you heard from your grandparents about, we want to hear those too. You can send them to us at stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.